So a few days ago now, Joe Biden gave his speech at the DNC accepting the nomination to be the Democratic presidential candidate. And um, I want to give you his speech in a nutshell here. Actually, I don't know if it's fair to say that. This is actually the parts of the the parts of the speech that got under my skin the most. But let's watch that. Then I want to respond to it. And also, I want to give you the overall sentiment and takeaway. Watch. And speaking of President Obama, a man I was honored to serve alongside for eight years as vice president. Let me take this moment to say something we don't say nearly enough. Thank you, Mr. President. You were a great president, a president our children could and did look up to. No one's going to say that about the current occupant of the White House. What we know about this president is if he's given four more years, he'll be what he's been for the last four years. A president who takes no responsibility, refuses to lead, blames others, cozies up to dictators and fans the flames of hate and division. This is our moment to make hope and history rhyme with passion and purpose. Let us begin, you and I together, one nation, under God, united in our love for America, united in our love for each other. For love is more powerful than hate. Hope is more powerful than fear. And light is more powerful than dark. This is our moment. This is our mission. May history be able to say, that the end of this chapter of American darkness began here tonight as love and hope and light join in the battle for the soul of the nation. And this is a battle we will win and we'll do it together. I promise you. Thank you and may God bless you and may God protect our troops. He ended with may God protect our troops. <laughs> You think they're leaning in a little bit to like the, hey, we're just like the Republicans, except not insane. Uh, I mean, that's what this is. And there was a lot of, there was the theme of faith. Like that was a big thing throughout the entire DNC. Family values. Again, big theme throughout the entire DNC. Marcos Melitsis tweeted the other day like i'm all about rubbing it in, in the republicans faces that now we're the party of god and we're the party of family values and it reminds me of something and i said jokingly the other day on twitter that you know i'm gonna believe in everything the republicans believe in to own them maybe you're not owning them maybe you're just becoming them and isn't the whole point to not be like them not do the things that they do not have the same value set, stand for something different, stand for something better? No, of course, that's out the window. So, I mean, pouring it on a little heavy there with the, uh, hey, we're Republicans. May God protect our troops. <laughs> Come on, man. But anyway, um, so now before I get into the responses to this specific, you know, portion that I just showed you, one of those parts was at, towards the beginning of the speech. The other part was towards the end of it. But um, overall, I actually think the speech landed. I do. Um, you know, whenever I watch these things, I try to give you two analyses. One is like what I think of it and how, you know, I'll, I'll pick apart the BS in everything he said. But the other analysis is like, how do I think your average American would interpret this speech. And, you know, from the average American perspective, I think there was just enough there that made this a successful speech. I, I do think it's very possible that just like in the debate with Bernie Sanders, I'm convinced they gave him something. <laughs> I'm convinced they gave him Adderall or they gave him Seroquel or a mix thereof. And, you know, so he was focused and he was sharp and he was quick-witted in the debate with Bernie. He was more like that than, you know, lost Uncle Joe. So I do think they probably gave him some sort of drugs to, like, you know, keep him coherent the entire time because Lord knows what will happen if he gets off script and if he's a little bit tired. Um, but the thing that made the speech, I think, overall successful and the thing that made it land with regular people, in my opinion, if you watch the entire thing, is that it's just, there's, it's just Uncle Joe enough to, to be relatable. Okay, like Joe Biden 
in today's day and age, he does have an interesting advantage that other politicians like Mayor Pete lacked. And that thing is that when Trump came along, he blew up this typical model of politician, which had been successful previously. The previous model was based off Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan was very actor-like, very on script, very professional sounding. And in many ways, you know, Obama was more of that variety or flavor of, of politician in terms of his appearance than Obama was like the newer breed. The newer breed of politician in the modern era uh, is more has to sound more off the cuff, unfiltered, shooting from the hip, because in today's day and age, you get the sense that that that's something that people find more relatable, more real, and like that person is not scheming behind my back. If somebody sounds like they have no filter, it's much more likely that they're not scheming behind my back than somebody like Hillary Clinton or Ronald Reagan or Barack Obama, who sounds too on script and too perfect and too professional that there's something else going on there that they're hiding from the public view. So what Joe Biden has that somebody like Mayor Pete didn't have is he does sound like Uncle Joe when he talks. I mean, sometimes he rambles and, you know, he's he's off the beaten path and he's talking about, like, emus and shit because his brain's not working. But <laughs> but he does sound like Uncle Joe when he talks. And so it was just Uncle Joe enough, I think, the speech to land with regular people. The other thing is Joe does have something that other politicians don't, which is he has that immense, deep, real personal tragedy in his life. Now, does that mean that he's definitely going to do all the right policy goals? Of course not. Not at all. In fact, he's decidedly against a lot of the things that we need, like Medicare for all. Um, but what will happen with average people who don't really follow politics that closely is they will infer by looking at Joe's personal tragedy and his personal story, and they'll go, oh, that guy's got to probably look out for me because look at everything he's been through. So he feels it. He knows the pain. You know, it, uh, they made a big thing about how Joe used to have a stutter, and so he helped this little boy with a stutter, and the little boy, you know, talked to the DNC and was like, he gave me the confidence that I needed to move forward, and everybody across the board was like, damn, that is sort of a touching story, regardless of what you think of Joe Biden. There was, an, there was um, somebody who worked um, at, at the Capitol in, like, the elevator, and Joe was, like, one of the only people who would stop and talk to this regular person about, hey, how's, how's it going, how's your day? And this person really meant a lot to the person. And so, you know, she spoke at the DNC and it was one of it, it was another sweet moment. We were like, OK, he seems like a regular guy enough to really feel people's pain. And of course, he had the personal tragedy with, you know, his his wife and the car accident and forget it with Bo. So there's a lot of personal tragedy there, which makes him more relatable. So you have the Uncle Joe aspect of it, where he sounds like he's shooting from the hip. And then you have the personal tragedy angle of it. And then you mix in with that enough of the return to normalcy, you know, vibe. And I think it's going to hit, it's going to strike a chord in today's day and age when everybody feels like everything is so haywire because Donald Trump is president and the country's falling apart. So I do think that overall, this speech is going to land. Now let me get to the second part of my commentary, which is how infuriating the things are that you just saw in that clip I just showed you. So he starts off by doing the thank you Obama thing. Guys, I don't know how else to say this other than Barack Obama is one of the main reasons Donald Trump got elected. A lot of people voted for Barack Obama, including myself, in 2008 and thought, I hope we're going to get like FDR style change. We had the subprime mortgage crisis and the Great Recession. The economy was imploding. We didn't want half measures. We wanted a new, new deal. That's what we wanted. One of the most important things was I wanted to end the wars. So what did Obama do? He didn't do a new New Deal, and he didn't end the wars. We're still in Iraq, we're still in Afghanistan to this day. So Obama sounding like this outsider and then being a status quo manager really let a lot of people down, especially in my generation, man. Like my generation, it, it's, it's we've been so turned off to politics because, you, you know, your hopes get up that there will be real change coming and then it's not delivered. And then you have the establishment looks at somebody like Obama and they think, no, he's the ultimate, you know, winner. And he's the ultimate success story because he managed that status quo properly. He sounded like an outsider and then he governed as an insider. And to Joe and the insiders, that's successful. You know, just like Bill Clinton was successful in his eyes. When, of course, Bill Clinton, you know, destroyed welfare um, did the Graham Leach Bliley Act, which repealed Glass Steagall, which led to a market crash. You know, I can go on and on. 
So the whole thank you Obama thing, it's like, oh, they literally have no idea how we got Donald Trump. In their mind, they really think it's all that Donald Trump's a vicious racist bigot and a bunch of vicious racist bigots voted for him. And that's the end of the conversation. No deeper analysis needed. They have no idea that the fake populism of Trump actually landed. The fake populism of Trump was, you know, one of the key ingredients which made him win the Rust Belt. And they turned uh, against TPP pushing Hillary Clinton and, and NAFTA supporting Hillary Clinton. So they, they never learned that lesson. Probably never even heard the argument. And so, you know, you go out there and it's, hey, thanks, Obama. That is, that's a, a, a reactionary worldview. Trump was saying, let's make America great again. What did he mean? Like, go back to like the 1950s, right? And then Biden comes along and says, let's make America great again. What does that mean? Go back to like 2012. But 2012 was also abysmal. See, a, a, a progressive instinct is let's actually create a future that is more successful than anything we've had to this point. And that's not what he's in favor of. He's in favor of let's make America great again like it was in 2012. Thanks, Obama. We think you were a great president. Listen, when your health care plan, which is one of his top accomplishments still left millions of people uninsured, that's not a success. That health care plan originally came from the Heritage Foundation, which is a right-wing think tank. It was supported by Newt Gingrich and Chuck Grassley, and, you know, Mitt Romney implemented a ver version of it in Massachusetts. It's better than nothing, but it's also not great, because you still have millions of people who aren't covered. So that's not enough, but he wants to run on, let's just build on that. That's not enough. And so I think that this represents a fatal flaw in the way the Democrats are thinking. And in any normal election year, this would lose. It would lose. The only reason it's it's very possible to work this time around, if maybe likely to work this time around, is because Trump is so abysmal and the pandemic is so crushing the country and the economy is so imploding that it, it could just be a swift anti-Trump change election and doesn't even matter what the hell he's saying. But they're going to take all the wrong lessons from it if they win. The lesson they're going to take is, oh, Obamaism is alive and well. Neoliberal corporatism is alive and well. The American people love it. And that, of course, is not true. So he goes on to say, and, and these are a lot of the kinds of arguments you see throughout the night. It's all character attacks. Oh, Trump, he doesn't take responsibility. Is that true? Yes, it is true. Oh, Trump, he's a bad leader. Is that true? Yes, that is true. Oh, Trump, he cozies up to dictators. Is that true? It's as true as what your administration did. You guys did weapons deals with Saudi Arabia as they did a genocide in Yemen. You're cozying up to dictators as well. So a lot of this is just, you know, the character attacks. Oh my God, he's such a bad person. It's not as much about the policies because they kind of agree with many of the policies. Nancy Pelosi has enabled Trump every step of the way, whether it's his, his Patriot Act NSA spying, which she increased his powers on that front. She gave him a bigger military budget than he ever had. So like... You guys enable him on that front, so you're not making it about the policies, because you're really not that different policy-wise. In some ways you are, but not in in, in every way. Um, and that's a shame. I wish it was more about policy than it was about, like, character! Because the personal quality angle, it's overplayed in politics. Somebody can have a shitty personal character, but will also fight as hard for you as possible on issues that matter. So it's just not the best measure. Um, and then finally, the last thing that he relied on, which, and by the way, this was basically the entire DNC, everybody did this, is, um, the flowery language, the platitudes, and the cliches. This is our moment. We're one nation under God. We're gonna give love and light and hope, and we're gonna turn away from the darkness. That doesn't mean anything. You may as well have gone up there and made a fart noise for three minutes and 37 seconds. That doesn't mean anything. Because you can, a Republican can say the exact same words. And their interpretation of what would, what that would entail is totally different than yours. Oh, you know, we need to be, uh, this is our moment, we need one nation under God. A Republican could say that and they mean like, hey, let's ban abortion. And, you know, when you say it, I don't know what you mean. But you just mean, you just want to fill the room with pleasant sounds. <laughs> That's what you're doing. Love is good, light is good, hope is good, darkness is bad. Thank you for saying absolutely nothing. And so, listen, you do get you do get the sense that this is the this is the the last 
gasps of a dying breed of politician that's only propped up by corporate money and, you know, is only in this position simply because the media convinced people with their propaganda that Bernie Sanders was an unsafe choice and so people defaulted to Biden thinking he was the safer choice. It's the only reason he is where he is. Immense propaganda and a ton of corporate money. And so it's just, it's just an older operating system, man. This stuff is not, this is not the future. It's just not. And um, so it's, it's really sad to see, but I think there's just enough there where, you know, it might be enough to get him through this election. And uh, all I have to say is that when we have the debates, break out the drugs again, because he's going to need it. And if he has them, he's got a decent chance. If he goes into these debates without drugs, oh boy, look out.